The Mariner's Mirror podcast is the world's number one podcast dedicated to all of maritime and naval history. We bring you the most exciting maritime projects worldwide, with one foot in the present and one in the past. From the age of timber and canvas and tall ships, to one in which ships were made of iron and steel and were powered by engines. The Mariner's Mirror podcast brings you right up to the present day and will change the way that you think about the maritime past forever. This week it's sea shanties. What on earth is going on? Those of you with an eye on the news and on social media will know that the major craze which has actually taken the world by storm, that's not a joke, it's true, is for sea shanties. It's almost unbelievable. In fact, I think it's, it is completely unbelievable. It all happened when a Scottish postman, Nathan Evans, His life changed overnight when he posted a TikTok video of him singing the famous sea shanty, The Weller Man. It was viewed very quickly over nine million times and sparked a huge trend with thousands of different versions of the song appearing from all over the world, including some of the most famous names in music. Nathan then signed a record deal with Polydor and released The Weller Man as a debut track and also a remix of it, which no doubt you will have heard on the radio. If you don't have any idea what I'm talking about, then just sit down and Google Weller Man, and particularly Weller Man TikTok, and you'll see what all the fuss is about. The song's fascinating. It's a well-known whaling song from the 1860s from New Zealand. The song frequently refers to Weller Men. They're supply ships owned by the Weller Brothers. That's Edward, George and Joseph Weller. They're all English-born They had migrated to Sydney and then headed further east and in 1829 founded a whaling station in Otaku uh, near modern Dunedin in the South Island of New Zealand. That's a full 17 years before the first British settlement of Dunedin. So these guys are real pioneers. From 1833, they sell provisions to whalers in New Zealand from their base at Otaku, uh, which they named Otago. Um, for the local Maori pronunciation. In its heyday in 1834, their whaling station was producing 310 tonnes of whale oil a year, and it became the centre of a network of seven different stations, all highly profitable. Uh, At Otago alone, they employed 85 people. But their success didn't last, because the colony of New Zealand was not actually declared until 1840. So the Weller brothers were treated as foreign traders, and they were affected by ruinous British import tariffs on their whale oil. They were declared bankrupt in 1840, and the station closed in 1841. So this song, long lasting though it may actually be, refers to just a glimmer of time in the Pacific whaling trade around New Zealand. The song's lyrics describe a whaling ship called the Billy of Tea and hunting for a right whale and the crew's hopes for a Weller Man. That's a supply ship sent by the Weller Brothers who bring them luxuries. They bring them sugar and tea and rum. The song is particularly noticeable for its reference to tonguing. That's the practice of cutting strips of whale blubber to render into oil. So that at least is the great story of the Weller Man. And, of course, you've guessed it, we've done our own version of the shanty. And here it is. It's a bit of me. It's a bit of Jerry Smith. He's our guest historian who will be talking about the history of sea shanties in a minute. And it's also a bit of Jamie White, our sound editor, who has also blended the whole thing together. There once was a ship that put to sea, and the name of the ship was the Billy of Tea. The winds blew hard about it, down or blow, my bully boys blow. Soon may the wellerman come to bring us sugar and tea and rum. One day when the tongue in his done, we'll take our leave and go. She had not been two weeks from shore When down on her a right whale bore The captain called all hands and swore He'd take that whale in tow Soon may the weller man come To bring us sugar and tea and rum One day when the tongue in his done We'll take our leave and go Before the boat had hit 
the water, the whale's tail came up and caught her. All hands to the side, harpooned and fought her when she dived down low. Whoa. Soon may the wellerman come to bring us sugar and tea and rum. One day when the tonguing is done, we'll take our leave and go. No line was cut, no whale was freed, and the captain's mind was not on greed. He belonged to the whaleman's creed, she took that ship in tow. Whoa. Soon may the wellerman come to bring us sugar and tea and rum. One day when the tonguing is done, we'll take our leave and go. For forty days or even more, the line went slack, then tight once more. All boats were lost, there were only four, and still that whale did go. Soon may the wellerman come to bring us sugar and tea and rum. One day when the tonguing is done, we'll take our leave and go. As far as I've heard, the fight's still on, the line's not cut and the whale's not gone. The wellerman makes his irregular call to encourage the captain, crew and all. Soon may the wellerman come to bring us sugar and tea and rum. One day when the tonguing is done, we'll take our leave and go. Soon may the wellerman come to bring us sugar and tea and rum. One day when the tonguing is done, we'll take our leave and go. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. A number of people were involved in that very entertaining project. Uh, and if you've enjoyed it, do send us your own version. I'd absolutely love to hear what you can come up with. Now, for a bit of history, I spoke this week to one of our leading historians of shanties, Jerry Smith. He's just released a book published by the British Library called Sailor Song on the history of these wonderful maritime songs. Originally from Dublin, Jerry Smith is an academic. He's a musician, an actor and a playwright. And he's professor of Irish cultural history at Liverpool John Moores University. I thoroughly enjoyed talking to him and I hope you enjoy listening to him too. Hi, Jerry. I think we should probably start at the beginning. What exactly is a shanty? Uh, I've been asked this quite a lot over the last couple of weeks, as you can imagine. Um, the, the, the definition of shanty that I've been working with is basically a 19th century work song that was sung on board the trading vessels uh, operating between Europe um, and the New World. Uh, mostly in the kind of Atlantic theatre of operations. Um, and it's it's a kind of singing that emerged in order to facilitate uh, the kind of work that was being uh, performed on board these large wind-powered sailing vessels. So that's the kind of definition of shanty that I've been working with. Yeah, it's it's a, quite a specific period of time. This um, you would I was reading your book talking about the nineteenth century when there's an explosion of maritime trade. Some might think that shanties are a lot older. Could you just talk a little bit about how you narrowed it down? I think they probably are a, a, a lot older. We don't have a great deal of evidence. There is some evidence that that uh, researchers have ha, have uh, accumulated o- over the years, but it's pretty scanty. Um, and it's not really until we get into this particular phase of maritime capitalism that a kind of canon of work starts to emerge that, that's subsequently collected uh, and preserved. And that's how we know so much about, of it, uh, about it. But in terms of kind of singing at sea, I, I, you know, what one imagines, it's, it's as old as the species itself, as long as people have been going to sea for whatever reason, um, but, but in, for one reason in particular, in order to make the job easier, in order to take, in order to take the, the, the task and the difficulty of getting from one place to another place uh, 
on 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 the ocean using whatever vessel that you happen to have people would sing in in order to kind of uh, alleviate fear and boredom in in order to make the the, the work uh, go quicker and perhaps also to kind of celebrate when when eventually they got to where they were supposed to be going yeah there's a there's a real question of efficiency as well with the work and um, so rather than just making the work go quickly the you know the ability to haul in time was crucial to be able to perform the tasks required of them that's right in in in, in relation to the shanty uh, somebody asked me in an interview last week uh, did other professions have work songs and i'm pretty sure they did we we know about kind of plantation songs for example we know about whaling sing- songs uh, logging uh, songs, uh, so the 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 idea of singing is, is is associated with a lot of professions. The particular uh, form that evolved in relation to kind of these big ships required precision, required a team of of men uh, doing the same action at the same time and utilizing uh, the the faculty of rhythm in order to kind of expedite that. So the song would have a kind of underlying rhythm. Uh, everybody would know it, everybody would recognise it, and everybody knew that they had to do the same thing at the same time during the song. That's what enabled the job to be uh, completed more efficiently. That's what enabled the ship to get from one side of the ocean to the other more quickly. And that's what drove profits. Um, so that that's that's what's peculiar about the the shanty as opposed to other forms of work song. Yeah, uh, you, the the example you give is I sell brooms, squeegees and swabs, which I liked very much. Could you explain that? Uh, this was a kind of line that was given to the gr- great collector Cecil Sharp um, sometime around the beginning of the 20th century when an old tar retired um, sailor was trying to explain the principle of the shanty. And he used this line, I, squ- I sell brooms, squeegees and swabs. In, in order to kind of explain. Uh, now, you can take that line and, and you can kind of put a, a, a rhythm underneath it. You, you can scan it, in other words, as the poets would do. Um, for example, you can do it in four over four time. You go, I sell brooms, squeegees and squabs, one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four, and I sell brooms, squeegees and swabs. Now, that rhythm is established and everybody's looking at everybody else and everybody knows that on the word swaps, you're all going to do the same thing, then that means that that, that, that job is, it's kind of generating um, energy above and beyond that possessed by the individual units of the team. So, um, but you can also kind of, you can do that, that same line in a different way. You could kind of, you could change the emphasis, for example, I sell brooms, squeegees and swabs. I sell brooms, squeegees and swabs. So that's a, that's a, that's a, a tri- triple time, um, six over eight. Um, so you can sing a different song uh, with a different rhythm, but you're, you're, you're heading towards the same end. Everybody doing the same thing at the same time on the word swabs, for example. With the people people listening to this, uh, make you realise how important it is that you have essentially a conductor, not necessarily a man with a stick, but someone who's very much in charge of what's going on, who decides how you're going to sing it, what you're going to do, when you're going to do it. And that, of course, was the shanty man. How important was he? I think the shanty man was very important, um, first of all, for the reason that you've already mentioned, that that uh, to coordinate effort um, is, is, is a... Uh, a very subtle skill. Uh, the shanty man was was somebody who was experienced both in maritime practice but also in shanty culture. So he would know the right song for the job of work at hand. Um, and he was the one who kind of said he was he was the one who would kind of identify the song, deliver the first line, and then everybody would fall into line. Um, but with, with, without him, I mean, I think you use the word conductor. You can imagine an orchestra t- trying to play without a conductor. I think there have been some experiments with this and it kind of works. But but really, the conductor is the person who, who kind of holds it all together. He's the kind of focaliser, to, to use a narrative term. Um, he's the one whose vision, as it were, um, makes the whole thing work and gives it a particular kind of signature and a particular kind of tone. That's why um, the same piece by a different conductor 
will will kind of function differently and, and will be performed differently. So it's probably the same in relation to the shanty man, although less less subtle. But a different shanty man will have a different tempo. He might choose a different song, um, and he and certainly he will use different lyrics because the lyrics of these songs never stay the same. Um, yeah, it, it made me wonder whether the um, the songs went with the ship or with the shanty man. Whether there was a tradition which went with, along with each ship or with the person leading it. What do you think about that? I'm not sure. I, th- I think it's more to do with the the shanty man and with the canon of songs that's available. Um, I, I don't doubt that there were different versions of songs sung on different vessels. Um, one, one of the things you find out about shanties when you start to kind of look at them a bit closely is that there are dozens and dozens of different versions of individual shanties. Um, and I'm sure it was the same between kind of different national traditions as well. Uh, there were the French German, Scandinavian, they all had versions of of shanties, but they would all be kind of um, uh, tweaked differently. Um, So the answer to that is I don't really know. I I guess a a good shanty man would have a canon of songs uh, available to him, but people would be producing new lines and new new versions all the time. Um, um, Many of the shanties were taken from kind of contemporary popular songs, uh, music hall or... Um, you know, kind of uh, pop, popular songs or sometimes art music from, from the 19th century. So we'd have to come up with a, a new set of lyrics or a kind of borrowed set of lyrics in order to fit the melody that, that, w- that was now uh, being, being used. So it's a very fluid process and a very fragmented process, I, I, I think. There's probably no hard and fast rule uh, to which one can kind of um, subscribe and say this is the way things actually were. Yeah. One of the things that really struck me was um, your uh, paragraphs on Capstan and Halyard songs. And I'd never really considered that there would be different types of shanties. I thought that was absolutely fascinating. Yeah, uh, I mean, for whatever kind of jobs were, 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 were needed on board the ship, um, <clears throat> the shanties were reserved for, for, for work. Um, and the sailors wouldn't sing shanties when they were off duty. They sang lots of other songs. Uh, they sang kind of ballads and this particular kind of song that that we, we call four bitters, referring to the part of the ship where they were sung. But w- when they were involved um, in, in all those onboard tasks, it, it kind of makes sense that because there are different kinds of tasks, different kinds of songs would evolve to suit them. So if you think about raising a sail, for example, these are big, heavy uh, pieces of cloth, you know, very heavy and they need kind of a particular kind of energy and a particular kind of physical action in in order to uh, to to raise them so the song has to be of a particular kind it has to have a length that gives the sailors a chance to to get their breath and to retrieve and store their energy you know to get ready for the next uh, uh, action that's a different kind of um uh, performance from say pushing a capstan uh, around r- raising a, a, a an anchor, which is much more kind of a continuous. Um, it has a team of men standing around a kind of circular uh, device, um, pushing on these bars, sometimes all day, if it was a very big ship, a very heavy ship. Um, so a different kind of um, song was 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 required because the actions weren't 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 exactly the same. They needed to be more continuous. You could even sometimes afford to sing uh, four line ballads uh, with with these as long as the people were were pushing at the same time and and there was a place for them to kind of come in afterwards. Um, pumping is another on on board task that that had kind of specific shanties attached to it. Uh, sweating up that's that last little pull in order to get the the last ounce of wind out of, out of a, a, a sail uh, holy stoning the decks uh, that's being, uh, cleaning them with, with little pieces of kind of holy stone um, so all these jobs had specific shanties attached to them there was probably a large amount of overlap but nevertheless that, that explains why uh, different kinds of shanties evolved yeah, I was I was reading uh, recently a wonderful little account of um, a couple. I've forgotten their names now. It's really annoying. But they um, travelled around schools in the early years of the 20th century collecting playground songs sung by children. And uh, because of their work, there's now an amazing audio archive. They recorded them. They actually went around with a little early kind of cassette recorder. 
how were these shanties recorded? And I suppose there's a there's a, there's a follow up question to that it, it, in terms of how you can kind of recreate an authentic shanty where they're just sort of reading the words and the music, you know, in, in any way you can can recreate it. Um, well, if, if if those collectors were going on recording, it must have been at least the 1920s, if not the 1930s or 40s, um, mm-hmm. uh, because uh, recording technology just wasn't up to the job um, b- before that. When, when the shanties first began to be collected in the 1870s and 1880s, people kind of went around and took, took it down by hand um, and they would... They would um, um, hopefully have some musical talent which would enable them to transcribe the the melodies uh, and, and to kind of salvage them. Um, and they would take down the words so far as they could get them, sometimes asking uh, particular individuals to sing songs over, you know, two or three times. Um, as, as, as the... the the f- kind of folk movement blossomed. The the collectors got more uh, dedicated, more professional, um, and and probably more talented as well. So by the time you get to people like Percy Granger and Cecil Sharp, they're they're very talented musicians who can hear and identify uh, and remember a melody probably only with one one listen. The lyrics were were more problematic um, and for reasons that I point out in the book that much of the time the lyrics um, that, that these early uh, um, recorders were, were hearing were um, categorically um, untranscribable for, 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 for them. The, the lyrics were, were full of bawdy material singing about sex and uh, all, all sorts of uh, other things which the sailors were happy uh, it's a very kind of male uh, environment, quite violent, uh, uh, and so on. So they were singing about about stuff that 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 they were they were kind of happy with. But the 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 collectors were hearing stuff that they weren't happy with. So e- either there was a bit there was a kind of degree of self censorship going on with with the 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 sailors. They would sing watered down versions for for the 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 uh, collectors, or the collectors themselves would change words that that they heard. Uh, and the answer to the kind of second or final part of your question is that it, it's a kind of f- forlorn hope to 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 um, to try to identify a kind of authentic shanty uh, in that respect because there never was an authentic shanty in the first instance. I I I I, I think there were songs that worked and that people knew um, in order to get the job done. Um, but that, that those shanties have never stayed the same in terms of their their melodies or their words or their tempo or any other aspect. The kind of category of authenticity is something that belongs to a different kind of level of 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 discourse or a different realm of discourse. It's much more associated with kind of or with literary culture in which we can kind of point to a novel and say, you know, that's the novel that that uh, Conrad wrote. OK, he may have revised it slightly here and there, but basically it it was written by him and it belongs to him. And we know the general kind of uh, shape and, and content of it. Whereas the shanties were, were changing all the time. They were changing, you know, from from work, from job to job um, uh, and, and from kind of moment to moment, from ship to ship uh, all, all the time. So... There were kind of the basic outlines of shanties in, in place. And these were the ones that the collectors collected, um, but 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 there was no no original to which they could refer back and say, "That's the real thing," and this one differs in this way. Yeah, it's a, a true living tradition in the sense that you know it's alive and alive things move and they change and they're really really difficult to pin down that's what i really like about this you've got a little snatch of it don't you yeah absolutely yeah 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 so not only do we have this fascinating history of shanties in general which we've been talking about but each each shanty itself is a wonderful story um and there are there are so many in this book uh, i just wanted to pick out a few which which I think, related to moments in my own personal history, which took me back to certain periods of my life. I've always been fascinated by sea shanties. Um, the first one um, was I listened to it on my 40th birthday. I was in a club in uh, Bristol listening to one of my favourite bands called Skinny Lister. And they sang uh, they sang the shanty John Kanaka. Uh, it's brilliant. And I did not know this extraordinary story behind it. Tell us about it. Um, 
So far as I remember uh, from 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 the book, my research um, uh, suggested that this was a West Coast American shanty in the first instance, and that it was associated with the the Hawaiian Islands, um, and it was probably sung by the by the stevedores and hoosiers who who were uh, loading and unloading ships in in the uh, the, the port uh, the, the port cities along America's west coast, San Francisco and the like. Kanaka, I think, is is a kind of semi derogatory term referring to Pacific Islanders. Um, I've kind of found evidence of, of the same term being used in Australia about their Pacific Island um, communities who were sometimes uh, press ganged in, into work, uh, in, into land work uh, uh, in, in Australia during the 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, so it, it has it, it has that that association um, and it's a kind of you're right. I mean, I, I've never heard Skinny Lister's version of it, uh, although I know the band. But it's a great song to sing, and it's got that really fantastic underlying rhythm, uh, which means you can have a lot of fun with it. And it's it's typical shanty. It's call and response. You know, um, I thought I heard the old man say, "John Kanakanaka Turaye, today today is a holiday." John Kanakanaka Turaye, and so on and so on. That was wonderful. Um, it, it makes you realise as well why it's so good, I think, because it's got these slightly alien words. It's got two rye in it, which it's actually got. I mean, you write here that it might refer to um, uh, as something from the Samoan language and that links to the, you know, the West Coast of America. It's not just a random thing that sounds nice. Uh, yeah, I kind of changed it because of my Irish bias. I changed it to... Uh, <laughs> Tour IA, but the, the the other researchers, Stan Hugel, who's one of my main sources uh, for the book, he says that it's a, it's a term of of Samoan or, origin. But of course, you're absolutely right as well. I mean, these are just pleasurable songs to sing much of the time. The lyrics are are kind of more important for how they sound and for the syllables that they fill up in the sentence, rather than you know they don't tell a coherent story. It's fun to say John Kanakanaka. It's fun to say it in the same way that kids have kind of uh, pleasure in in just saying nonsense words. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the whole the whole history of of kids' nonsense rhymes as well is is, is extraordinary, and they're geniuses at coming up with words that are just super fun to say. Maybe sailors share a bit of that child um, childish playfulness. Um, another one was um, I, I heard this in Glastonbury um, at some point. I think in the early two thousands. And I was listening to Bellowhead and they were singing Roll Alabama Roll. Um, I love Bellowhead and I particularly love their version of Roll Alabama um, because they're so playful with the time. Um, But this this is a this is a it's a it's a it's a more kind of a straight story about the American Civil War. That's right. The uh, the Confederacy uh, commissioned a ship to be built that would harass the the north's uh, trading ships um and uh, they commissioned it to be built in um Birkenhead um and it was financed by Liverpool Capital I uh, think in Liverpool's a very important uh, maritime city during the 19th century very wealthy um city as well so they um they commissioned it uh, uh as a just a kind of sailing ship the 292 it was called um it was launched sailed down the mersey and once it got beyond british imperial waters it was renamed the alabama and became uh, a ship of war and it it had a a pretty bloody career for about 2 years in in which it sank a lot of them uh, um um uh, northern uh, uh, ships all around the world uh, until it finally came a cropper in Cherbourg um, in 1864 where it was sunk by uh, the, the ship the Kiosage. Um Interesting to, to observe as well that, uh, that the, most of the crew escaped and many of them were picked up by uh, a British MP's um, pleasure yacht taken back to England and the crew were repatriated to the southern states uh, where, where they went on to, to um, continue to fight in, in the American Civil War until it finished the following year. Um, I should say that um, the great thing about Jerry's book is that all of these stories are are described alongside the shanties where you have the uh, not only the lyrics but also 
the uh, the music as well. Oh, I'm looking at one here, and this brings me back to Padstow in Cornwall. I was illegally in a pub. I must have been about 16, <laughs> I think, and I was listening to them sing South Australia in uh, in, in the way that only um, the, the folk singers of Padstow can do, which is usually done with about 50 piano accordions and mm-hmm. a great deal of shouting. Um, but it's a, this is a super fun one to sing as well. Yeah, yeah. My, my first um, exposure to this was the, was the version by the Pogues, um, which I think was included on their 1987 album, If I Should Fall From Grace With God. Um, and it was supplied by um, by a famous Irish folk singer that they had drafted in um, um, just, just a little earlier, a, a guy called Terry Woods. Uh, so he sang that, a kind of really rip-roaring v- version of it, very fast, and with that snare drum be behind it, which was so typical of the, of, of the Pogues. And then, yeah, I kind of found out about it, like you, uh, kind of listening to people sing it in folk clubs and, and, and at folk festivals and so on. And I found out a little bit more m- more about it. Uh, there's not a great shanty connection with Australia, despite the large amount of, of trade and traffic that there was between Australia and, and Britain, for example, in 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 the 19th century um, but this is one uh, that, that 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 there is um, um, and it's, you're right it's a fun one to sing um, when you get everybody it's it's uh, in, interesting I mentioned in the book that it's probably one of the only few shanties that has references to both uh, heaving and hauling in in the same the, the same song um, for reasons that I described earlier on most of the shanties would either be solely heaving songs uh, or solely hauling songs um but this one has a chorus of heave away haul away uh which is great <laughs> i just think it's it's, a, it's it's great fun yeah um well, let's finish with the most famous one of all the drunken sailor because you you reveal some truly extraordinary facts about that because uh it's roots it's irish roots that's right well um and I, you know, we I said earlier on that uh, these these these, um, these songs are 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 kind of made up of bits and pieces lyrically and and melodically from 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 all over the place. So um, it it wouldn't be a surprise, I, I think, to, to find that many of the shanties have melodies that are borrowed from from folk songs, from Irish folk songs, sometimes English folk songs and. American folk songs as well. This one is an old march uh, from 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 uh, Gaelic civilization b- before the the kind of f- proper fall of 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 of, of that civilization um, and and the onset of the kind of seventeenth century religious wars. Um, it's the song itself is Oroshe de um, uh which basically means something like uh, "Hooray, welcome home." And it has a melody that you can hear. And we all learned this at school when I was growing up in, in, in Dublin in the 60s and 70s. It goes, O Roche the Vaha Walya, O Roche the Vaha Walya, O Roche the Vaha Walya, a nocturne tick and tauri. Uh, and that kind of, you can see how that would have been picked up um, because it's got that underlying rhythm. Ding 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 diddle ding 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 diddle ding ding ding. What shall we do with a drunken sailor early in the morning? It's kind of modal tune that uh, it it doesn't really fit into a kind of minor or major tonality, but but again, it's it's kind of great fun to sing. Although if you look at the lyrics, it's kind of pretty horrific, really. The kind of things that they're doing to the poor old drunken sailor, they're shaving him and they're making him drink uh, poison water and all sorts of things. So uh, good fun to sing, but possibly not, not as salubrious as we, uh, we might suspect. No. Well, let's leave it there, Jerry. I'm inspired. I'm going to go and take my dog for a walk now and I'm going to be singing South Australia as loudly as I can off the cliffs of Dartmoor. Fantastic. Thank you so much for, uh, for talking to me today. You're very welcome. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Bye-bye. Well, that's it for today. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this special on Sea Shanties. Do please follow us on social media. You can find the Society for Nautical Research on Twitter. You can find the Mariner's Mirror pod on YouTube and on Instagram. And uh, how can you help? You can please leave us a review on iTunes. But best of all, please just sign up to the Society for Nautical Research at snr.org.uk. And your subscription fee will go towards publishing the most important maritime history and towards preserving our maritime past. That's it for now, guys. Bye.